all the books I've found at my local library, this one certainly takes the cake in being the most dense, densely informative, and visually stunning and accessible, accessible in bounds, giving information to the layman about where it is we currently know that we are in the universe, our stance, our place, and what we found after a few hundred years now of deep, thorough, scientifically rigorous investigation into the cosmos. So let's find out what we know about our place in the universe. This sums it up appropriately here. You're about to embark on an unforgettable journey, setting off from the heart of the solar system to the outer limits of the known cosmos. This book reveals space in all its awe-inspiring wonder. Other books describe various aspects of space. This book shows you, taking you on a dazzling visual exploration of every type of astonishing feature and phenomena of the universe. And it really does. The reason I chose this book for this huge undertaking was really this first image here sums it all up and immediately absorbed me into the, it convinced me of the merits of this book. It's just beautiful to see a, a three-dimensional representation that you usually don't get when looking at Earth. We have the billowing clouds. Let's see. And we notice right here, in the Pacific Ocean, above the water, are clouds of water vapor and volcanic and a volcanic ash plume, a reminder of the continuing geological activity of the planet's interior. And I love the vistas. It reminds us there's so many different perspectives about space we can take. Going out 90 million miles from the Earth, we have the Sun. As, and this is just uh, the first few pages are a nice introductory immersion, getting our toes wet. Just to give you guys a brief idea. Here we have. This book is just so packed. We got cosmic models of the predicted evolution of the universe. We got the Large Hadron Collider. We have depictions and diagrams explaining relativity. Here we have a deep, deep underground neutrino observatory. All of these things we'll be getting into. Breaking down the physics, the science, the observations, and the deductions of what we know about the universe. The sun dominates our solar system, our chief source of light and heat. It also holds Earth and the rest of the planets in their orbits. This ultraviolet image here shows a reveals the dynamic activity in the ultra-hot corona above the sun's surface. Just imagine being close enough. Imagine spending your whole life studying astronomy in the 17 and 1800s and never always wondering what these black dots are on the surface of the sun, and now we're privileged enough to have 
the experience and hard work and the results of hundreds of years, if not thousands, of technological labor and innovation to be able to give us a beautiful, ridiculously close-up view of the sun like this. We could see the little pockets, each of these pockets of bubbling plasma are probably as wide as our Earth, maybe. In these regions cooler and darker than the rest of the sun's surface, speaking about the sunspot, are sustained by strong magnetic fields, penetrating and twisting and being distorted within and through and around the sun. Some sunspots are large enough to engulf the entire Earth. They vary in cycles that take about, on average, 11 years to complete. And peaks in the cycle coincide with disturbances, such as aurora in our own atmosphere. And that's to say that the sun is a a collection of billions of nuclear reactions, nuclear bombs going off all at the same time, every second, and it's a source of, it's the central source of all the energy, and it billows out, and actually billows out to such an extent that it creates a, well it can be destructive, if bit of matter is ejected precisely at our planet. It's interestingly and paradoxically maybe also very protective, almost like how a parent can discipline their children, yet be the thing that protects them from all the dangers of the outside world. It envelops the solar system in a bubble, a protective bubble through its solar winds. And the Voyager spacecraft actually hit what we know as the bow shock at the edge of our solar system, way past Pluto and all the other Oort cloud objects. And once it pierced through that layer, it instantly was in the interstellar medium of the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which is a, just a current, a wild set of currents of interstellar winds. And we have the planet Jupiter's great red spot here. The gas giant Jupiter is more massive than all the other planets in the solar system combined, including Saturn. Its mysterious swirling vortex, the great red spot, has been known since the 17th century, but our knowledge of Jupiter has improved greatly since then. When the planet was visited by uncrewed spacecraft, unmanned in the 70s, this image of the great red spot was taken in 1979 by the Voyager, one of two that has since left our own solar system headed out into the galaxy. And this here is using filters that exaggerate its colors for easy comprehension by our human eye. So again, this is just a brief tour and we'll be getting into much more in-depth details about the universe. And then moving from the Earth to the Sun to some of the outer planets, now we have stars and galaxies. Briefly, the Orion Nebula is actually part of a much larger region of the galaxy, which, on the edge of which, which we, our star, and thus our solar system actually lies. And this Orion Nebula is the most visually interesting, bright, active part of a nebula that 
almost like a region, you might say, a big bubble in the galaxy. But this picture right here depicts the most active star-forming region. Each little nodule here is a dense area of gas, interstellar gas, that has begun to collapse, and as it collapses on itself, it begins to be set in rotation, and as it rotates, it increasingly gets closer and closer together, it gets more dense, until at the center of it, enough matter, enough gaseous material has accumulated to be put under tremendous strain tremendous strain and it ultimately the collapsing particles just like the transition from potential energy of an object being dropped off a cliff accelerating towards the center of mass of earth all these particles are releasing their potential energy that gravity has given them and turning it into heat and friction which is kinetic energy and as they all jumble together they bounce off one another in this torrid current of fluctuations in speed and rotation they start to release a bunch of infrared heat we can detect in the infrared wavelength and then after that they get more and more dense more hot more pressure is imposed on them by the gravity of incoming mass until at the very core enough pressure has exceeded a threshold and the particles begin to fuse they overcome the strong nuclear force and fuse fuse together to release vast amounts of energy billowing out all the yet uncollected gas around them into a net, another bubble. It's super interesting, and so that's the birth of a star. You know, all the solar winds from this now self-sustaining process of nuclear fusion billows out and wipes away most other remaining static particles to kind of carve out a little piece of the galaxy for itself in the larger planetary-like proto-planetary-like objects yet to form around it starting its own family if you will so this is a really cool snapshot of one of the closest star forming areas in the galaxy to us and we can see star birth on all its stages of evolution we have stars that have already been born we have dense regions of clouds that have yet to fully collapse but are still emitting infrared light and then we have more nebulous areas that are waiting and waiting to be shocked by their neighboring collapsed newly formed stars to that emit solar winds which kind of send an impulse of energy through like waves through the more effervesc effervescent clouds to um, initiate and catalyze enough momentum and energy to maybe have some regions form stars of their own. And then finally on our brief little introductory tour here, moving from the Earth to the Sun to the outer limits of the Sun and the solar winds and the local nebula birthing new stars, we jump outside our galaxy. We jump, take a voyage off our island our local island in the universe into the limits of time and space because as we know light is actually a finite 
travels at a finite speed, and so therefore the further we go out into the universe, the further back in time we can look as it takes light time to travel across such vast distances. So we hear dwarf galaxies bursting into life. Tiny Young, this image is of galaxies about 9 billion, billion with a B, years, light years from Earth. So it's taken 9 billion years for the light to reach us, and therefore we're seeing it all these galaxies as they existed, as they looked, nine billion years ago. Not only about four or five, maybe, billion years after the Big Bang, as far as we know at the moment. Tiny young galaxies brimming with stars in the process of formation, some nine billion light years away, are seen in this image, taken at near-infrared wavelengths. That often helps astronomers be able to pierce the more opaque um, material that visible light often can't penetrate. So that's why they choose to uh, see the, the more permeable infrared or near-infrared wavelengths. They stand out in the image because energy from the new stars has caused oxygen in the gas around them to light up like a neon sign. This phase of rapid star birth is thought to represent an important stage in the formation of dwarf galaxies, the most numerous type of galaxy in the universe. And here we have a two-dimensional, or three-dimensional, I guess, representation of galaxy superclusters. It was generated here in this image. Let me show you guys. By plotting the positions of 15,000 galaxies. It depicts the topographic features of our cosmic environment out to about seven, 700 million light years from Earth. The yellow blobs are superclusters of galaxies which are interspersed with black voids millions of light years across, tens of millions. And here again, this, this uh, view of our galaxy in the infrared shows how galaxies outside the Milky Way are distributed in cluster, clusters and filamentary structures. The galaxies are color-coded according to brightness with the bright ones in blue and the faint ones in red. And here is a, another quick example of the different information scientists can get by observing the universe in different wavelengths, which we'll get into more in the future here. The massive cluster of galaxies is one of the most distant known to astronomer. astronomers. Some 8.5 billion light years away, superimposed on the optical picture here um, behind it, this kind of purpley blob is an x-ray image revealing hot gas shown in purple that pervades the cluster. So there's so many things that is revealed to us that we otherwise wouldn't be able to detect to detect with visible telescopes. Okay. So that's a brief overview of the different scales in just a few, just a quick glean of 
some of the things to come right now. So let's get into what is the nature of the universe. And here we have a, another awesome image. We can see, again, a better, <laughs> everything's better visually seen, um, observed, than, than just described. It's always hard to describe it, but this image here is a beautiful depiction of just how strong the solar winds, which are just the energy waves created by the atomic blasts arising from the nuclear explosions created from the pressure of these billions and billions and billions of kilo, kilograms of material just churning onto itself. And once that energy hits the exterior of the surface of the star, it gets released into the void, the near void of space, and it creates spherical waves of energy that shock the surrounding gas molecules, and it creates like a almost like a shield, a bubble emitted and ejecting outward from it. Here's a quote by the famous astronomer and cosmologist Stephen Hawking. There are grounds for cautious optimism that we may now be near the end of the search for the ultimate laws of nature. He really thought that we, and we might be, and obviously his speculation is much more accurate and informed than mine. So it's really, it is encouraging to know that he felt one of the leading scientists and just minds in general of our time really was convinced and so inspired by just how much we're able to explain about the universe that he felt were on the verge of understanding the all layers of the laws of physics from the quantum chaotic probabilistic immaterial intangible abstract microscopic subatomic levels all the way up to this gargantuan awful immense unimaginably vast reaches of voids in galaxies in galaxy superstructures and that we're able to understand across all distances the laws of physics to the extent that we are is really truly remarkable and something to uh, something to definitely revel in I think so the universe is all of existence and remember that means us too I love Carl Sagan's view and his understanding of the universe and as us as the actual embodiment of the universe being created from the carbon and nitrogen and iron in our blood which was you know ejected into space from supernova billions of years ago which ultimately formed the little neighborhood the little nice house garden of eden that we know as earth out of our sun and therefore after billions of years of evolution on earth we finally come to be cognizant and evolve this consciousness completely out of this material and we can't explain it but we are a way for the universe to know itself and that's what we're doing as scientists and inquisitive people looking after the truth we are the universe trying to understand itself The universe is unknowably vast, and ever since it formed, it's been expanding, carrying distant regions apart at speeds up to, and in some cases possibly even exceeding, light. The universe encompasses everything from the atom to the largest galaxy cluster. So we're going to answer 
answer some of the questions that cosmologists, you know, and all the variations of people who study everything outside of the earth, put forth. How big is it? How old is it? And how does it work? Even on the grandest of scales. First, we gotta put things into perspective of distance and understand the scale of the universe. Everything in the universe is part of something larger. I mean, fundamentally, we are made up of systems. You know, you are a system of cells which form together into certain systems that we call organs, like kidneys and you know, GI tracts and your heart and your bloodstream and your limbic system and your nervous system. And then we, of course, the electrical signals and impulses and the emergent property of our emergent quality of consciousness is a part of that whole body system. And then you live in a system of social relationships where your mind is influenced and influences other minds. We call friendships and family and loving relationships. And then we exist in societies and nations interact with one another. And that's not to even mention the symbiosis in other biological life on earth, like plants and animals and animals that cease to exist like the dinosaurs. And then we have a solar system. And outside of that, we have star groups of stars that float around the lazy river of our Milky Way galaxy, orbiting it every 200 million years. And then we have systems of galaxies that float in the voids of the universe together as well. So where is our place in that So the scale of the earth and its moon may be relatively easy for the human mind to grasp being, you know, a few thousand miles across and the moon being about 220,000 miles away. You know, it, um, even that is kind of hard to comprehend. But once we get bigger than that, the nearest star is unimaginably remote, Alpha Centauri four light years. It takes only eight minutes for light to reach Earth from the sun. It takes four years for our sun's light to reach the nearest star. And then the farthest galaxies are billions of times more distant than that, than that even. Yet, um, so cosmologists who study the size and structure of the universe use mathematical models to build a picture of the universe's vast scale. Here we start. Let's see. So what's awesome, I love the courage for this book to be so informed by knowledge, and yet it, it also loves to speculate. That's what I, I think really fills the, um, the, the journey, the voyage of, through, you know, of our understanding and the adventure of science, is that the possibilities are really infinite, and it's fun to speculate on what all that we know about it could actually mean. And here they're talking about how, for all that we know, we actually aren't 100% certain about the characteristics of the universe on the largest scales. It could be infinite. Alternate, alternatively, it might actually have a finite volume, but even a finite universe would have no center or boundaries and would curve in on itself. So. So paradoxically, 
an object traveling off in one direction would eventually reappear from an opposite direction, like traveling around the earth. But a person traveling around the earth being kind of just on the two-dimensional surface of a three-dimensional object, they're talking about the universe, the th all three dimensions itself would be curving. Space itself would curve. So eventually we would reappear from the opposite direction. But what is certain though, is that the universe is expanding and has been doing so since its origin. So we know it's been expanding since its origin about 14 billion years ago. 13.7 to be, I guess, the most specific estimate currently. The, by studying the patterns of radiation left by the Big Bang, called the cosmic microwave background, a steady stream of microwave wavelength, which are um, fairly large wavelengths that have been emitted from all the chaotic jumble before, right after the Big Bang, before everything kind of cooled off and collapsed into more organized matter and in groups of stars and dust that would eventually form galaxies. So from this microwave background, scientists have been able to estimate that some parts of the universe must be separated by at least 10 billion light years. So here, from our local to our farthest perspectives of distance, we have the Earth and the Moon system. Then it goes as us being a small, very, very small part of our solar system, at least in terms of size. I think we're uh, the most complex part of our solar system that uh, nobody would be able to really argue against. Then, out of our solar system, we recognize that the sun is just one of billions of stars rotating around the galactic nucleus. The closest star to our sun, Alpha Centauri, lies 4.35 light years away, or 25 trillion miles. That's 25,000 billion miles. Within 20 light years of the sun are 79 different star systems containing 106 stars. The total includes binary stars, which actually happen to be the most the most frequently forming, which actually happen to be um, not as rare as you would think. In fact, they're they're almost as common as single star systems. So, these binary stars of some of our local, most local nearby stars are actually Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. The, um, and the most of the rest are small, dim stars. So the Milky Way part of a disk of now one, about 200 billion stars orbiting. So we are in a fairly large galaxy, which is all the more reason to believe that there's definitely got to be different solar systems out there with life. It's really just a matter of wondering what level of intelligence and evolution and consciousness that life has um, had the opportunity to reach at the moment. So the Milky Way itself isn't just stars, of course, like we said. We're looking at this image here of the Orion Nebula. The Milky Way is a 
sea of potential new stars, and it's not going to, you know, diminish and dissipate into nothingness anytime soon. Not for, you know, trillions of years, really. Or at least hundreds of billions of years. There is just massive areas of our galaxy that are just these gargantuan interstellar clouds just waiting to be, you know, shocked into, or, uh, uh, you know, catalyzed into collapsing on itself. Just all it needs is a little nudge, a little infusion from a nearby supernova or even a smaller regular nova to collapse. And so we have yet to see all of the stars potentially um, able to form in our Milky Way form and be birthed. Now, the Milky Way itself, and here's a, actually a pretty cool, I almost overlooked, a three-dimensional representation showing you the, you know, how far off the galactic ecliptic plane some of these stars lie up. So there's our sun, Sirius, it's right there. You know, Alpha Centauri is pretty darn close. And these are all our local neighbors. So now we go on to the galaxies. Um, you know, our Milky Way galaxy in the local group of galaxies. Which scientists are very practically minded, so that's exactly what they called the our neighboring us and our neighboring galaxies. It's called the local group, and that includes the other biggest one is Andromeda, which has, um, just like we, we have satellite galaxies, satellite dwarf galaxies, or um, even what, what's called globular clusters of stars orbiting our galaxy. There's tons of other smaller galaxies orbiting Andromeda and the third largest galaxy in our local group, Triangulum. So it's a region about 10 million light years across. Andromeda is about 2 million light years away. And again, I love the three-dimensional depiction. So it gives us, you know, the regular Cartesian XY coordinate system. And it adds the Z axis, which is depth. So we can see a much easier, much easier comprehensible perspective of where the galaxies lie with respect to us. So it contains about 50 known galaxies. And most other galaxies are small, so much smaller than the very And then now, our local group is, of course, systems and systems. You know, it's like the Russian nesting doll. We're part of a larger cluster called the local supercluster of galaxies. The local. Let's see. And with each of these, we see different scales. So to give you an idea of each um, coordinate, you know, each grid, each time st or distance step, each of these grid lines. On the local group, it was 250,000 light years. This is 10 million light years now. So whole local group fits within one of these grids, these little squares. The local group of galaxies together with some nearby galaxy clusters, such as the giant Virgo cluster, is contained within a vast structure called the Virgo supercluster, and that's a hundred million light years across. 
including dwarf galaxies, and that's about 10, that's on the order of tens of thousands of galaxies. And then, again, moving beyond that, the local supercluster, we have large-scale structures, galaxy superclusters, clump it in knots, or they extend as filaments that can be billions of light years long, with large voids separating them. However, at the largest scale, the density of galaxies, and thus all visible matter, is actually uniform. So, it's much like looking at a sponge, or, um, you know, a three-dimensional spider's web, where locally, the more you zoom in, it does look like it's pretty heterogeneous, but the more you zoom out, you recognize that the voids in the filaments are on average, on average, pretty equidistant from one another, so it ends up looking much more homogeneous. And this right here, and this I wanted to show you much more close up because this is one of the one of the many cool things I was about to say the coolest but it's just one of the many cool things that makes me so just amazed just filled with with such a sense of wonder the vast galaxy cluster will certainly be getting into more detail later but I just want to briefly show you these lines right here are, they aren't um, any warping in the lens of the telescope. This is actually what's called gravitational lensing. And what that means is there's a galaxy whose, whose gravity, there's a galaxy in front of a galaxy whose light is being warped by the gravity of that galaxy in front of it. And what that comes out to us, two billion years away from it, is the light, we can see here in the rings, being stretched out concentrically around the galaxy and being warped. So it looks like we're looking in a funhouse mirror almost. And it's just so incredible that an entire galaxy's light can be completely distorted into a ring-like shape around another, uh, you know, set of galaxies. So, on the fastest scales of the universe, we have these filament-like structures we can see down here. And really does look like some effervescent web, a translucent spindling, <laughs> but each of these little filaments are millions of light years across, or maybe tens or even hundreds, and hundreds of billions of light years long, which, I don't know about you, but it's, uh, it's more fascinating than, you know, the best movies out there or the best literature or, um, you know, fictional material out there. I think reality truly is stranger than fiction. And it's, and it's just beautiful to be able to imagine and, and actually remember the reality of the situation that we're in and remember and remember the reality of the situation that we actually live within. And there's no bigger adventure than studying reality, whether it's the cognitive history and archaeology of, you know, myth and religion and 
the emergence of consciousness, the most complex thing in the world, in the universe, really, or the vast distances, the overwhelmingly, bewilderingly large and small scales that we've been able to probe the universe on. So, we're in one large, mysterious thing that is just incredibly absorbing and meaningful and fun to explore, I think. So, the last thing on this page is a cool little schematic. I love, again, the visualizations that we get with this book. It's showing um, two people, two observers, surrounded by a sphere, and that sphere is meant to represent the distances the furthest distances at which we're able to see back into the universe because, of course, we understand that based on a lot of complex observations and a long history of observing space itself expanding, we know in, in the evolution of galaxies and stars, we recognize that the largest structures, including, you know, made up of galaxies, had to have arrived at where they are from a certain starting point. At least, um, that's what the, the evidence indicates currently. And that is when we extrapolate the observed evidence, the red shifting of galaxies, which means that they're traveling increasingly further away and what Einstein and Hubble and many other brilliant genius observers of the universe have concluded was that space itself in between the galaxies is expanding in much like a uh, the often mentioned you know raisin bread if the bread starts to bake and it has raisins roughly uniformly smattered throughout, the distance between each raisin is going to increase as the entire loaf itself expands. And if the, in the further away you are from a particular raisin, if you're within the loaf looking, you know, trying to observe other raisins, the f faster those other raisins are going to expand or appear to be expanding indefinitely. So, these two observers, um, they have a little bit of an overlapping field. And so, if there's an observer, I guess the point of this is to demonstrate that the universe might look like this for us, but if there's another intelligent observer from a planet in a galaxy 10 billion years away from us, or closer to the edge of our visible universe, if you will, then that person, his horizon of observable phenomena in the universe is going to be shifted by another 10 billion light years. So he's going to be able to observe galaxies and phenomena much more distant than, than we can. And likewise, we can uh, look at things that will be beyond his visible horizon as well. So that's all to say that we, we think the universe is about 13.7 billion years old. But that doesn't, that's much smaller than the actual distance in light years that we think the universe is. Because not only does it take, because not only does it take 13.7 billion years for light to reach us from other distant galaxies, the most distant of galaxies, but the space has expanded so much in that 13 billion years that um, the galaxies we can see 
are now well beyond our event horizon, our observable cosmological horizon, I guess it might be called. So I, I believe the current estimate for the diameter of the universe is something like 90, 95 billion light years across, which is just astounding. solid 
crystalline structure and there would be no interactions, no movement. Some of the matter drifts through space as single atoms or simple gas molecules. Other matter clumps into islands of material, from dust motes to giant suns, or they even implode to form black holes the largest of which we call supermassive, that lie at the center of galaxies. Gravity binds all these objects into great clouds and disks of material known as galaxies. Galaxies in turn fall into clusters and finally form the biggest celestial objects of all, super clusters. Gas, dust, and particles are the most important aspects of the universe because they are what become the stars and the black holes and the galaxies themselves. Much of the ordinary matter of the universe exists as a thin and tenuous gas within and around galaxies, and even as thinner gas between galaxies. So the gas is made mainly of hydrogen and helium, the most abundant atoms, elements in the universe, just mainly because they're the simplest. And uh, they were the first to form after the Big Bang, being the simplest hydrogen, having just one proton with an associated electron in Helium having just two protons with, um, in the nucleus with, of course, the, uh, the neutrons to follow in different iso isotopes. So those are the most abundant and lightest elements, but of course some clouds inside galaxies may contain atoms of heavier chemical elements and uh, even simple molecules. Mixed in with the galactic clouds is dust, tiny solid particles of carbon or substances such as silicates, compounds of silicone and oxygen. Within galaxies, the gas and dust make, they make up what's called the interstellar medium. So between all the stars of the Milky Way galaxy in particular, because that's the one that we live in, and that's the one we can best study, is this stream, this current of just dispersed gas waiting again to be collapsed into newly formed stars. Now, visible clumps of this medium may, many of them, uh, the sites of star formation, are called nebulae. Some, called emission nebulae, actually produce a brilliant glow as their constituent atoms absorb radiant energy from the stars and they re-radiate it as light. So they become these glowing clouds, as we can see here and here in the Carina Nebula. In contrast, we have dark nebulae. These are visible only as smudges that block out starlight. Here, here's an example of a dark nebulae. A globule of dust in dense gas, Barnard 68, is an example of a dark nebulae. The thick dust obscures the rich star field behind it, and they know that, which is super, super cool, I love it, that they can pierce this dark veil. It's very opaque, non, you know, light transferable clouds of dust and gas, um, yet if they just create an instrument that's able to look at x-rays or microwaves or infrared 
ultraviolet wavelengths, anything that's um, other than visible light, oftentimes they're able to see exactly, exactly what's behind that cloud. And to me, that is uh, so, so amazing. It's just one more example of how we can slowly, you know, step by step, incrementally pierce the veil the mysterious veil that the universe has laid before us and peel it back and kind of peek behind and see how the universe works. So, particles of matter also exist in space in the form of cosmic rays. Highly energetic subatomic particles traveling at high speeds throughout the cosmos. And again, we can, with the right instruments, we can also detect cosmic rays. The Carina Nebula, which this is a beautiful picture right here, is a giant cloud of gas. It's a prominent feature of the sky in the southern hemisphere and is visible to the naked eye. It's so big. Different colors in this image represent different variations in temperature of the gas. And then over here we have stars and brown dwarfs, and then we're going to go on to the remnants of stars and planets. The universe's light, of course, comes mainly from stars, these hot balls of gas that generate energy through nuclear fusion in their cores. Stars form the, from the condensation of clumps of gas and dust in the nebula and sometimes occur in pairs or even in clusters. Depending on their initial mass, stars vary in color, surface temperature, brightness, and lifespan. The most massive stars known as giants, and supergiants even, are the hottest and brightest but as you might imagine, because they're so bright and have such enormous pressure condensing and compressing all the matter inside the star, it's going to burn it much more quickly. And so these things, they last, our star, our sun, lasts on the order of 5 to 10 billion years. That's a fairly average, fairly main sequence star. These large supergiants, they burn out in sometimes less than 10 million years, maybe 100 million years, only one-tenth of a billion years. So relatively fast compared to most stars. And of course, as soon as they burn out, they go into either supernova or just nova, and they release and they spew out all their material again to be captured or initiate other star formation in nearby nebulae. So over the course of, you know, five to ten billion years of a regular sun like our own, there is many, many supergiants constantly just collapsing, um, forming, birthing, going through their life cycle very rapidly, and then emitting burning up through nuclear interactions and fusion, all their matter and energy, eventually to the point where the matter inside the core is used up so much and so quickly that it no longer can hold the gravitational forces compressing it at bay, and it collapses down, or they uh, their atmosphere has become too diffuse. And then after co collapsing from their own gravitational pressure, they, the inside kind of rebounds and reverberates that energy and swells up again. And this happens a couple times to the point where the star expands as a, uh, as a undergoes a reactionary expansion so much that 
it almost becomes too big to no longer hold onto its most external atmosphere and that starts to dissipate into space and then the remnants evolve and collapse into uh, smaller stars so this process is continually going on all throughout the galaxy constantly renewing the energy impulses and adding to the chaos of energy known as the intergalactic winds and medium just like we we feel solar winds if our spacecraft between earth and the moon and beyond emitting from our sun if they travel out there they're going to be able to detect much solar wind but if they like the voyager spacecraft go much much beyond our solar system they're going to start to recognize the sheer mass fluctuations in dynamic swirling of energy in between the stars and this is all because of this constant created by the constant life cycle the life and death cycles of these quickly evolving short-lived stars on the other end of the stellar mass spectrum we have low mass stars the most numerous and they are small dim red oftentimes because they they don't burn as brightly and as hotly so generally red is much more cooler than blue very white hot blue stars are the hottest and so these ones are burning their fuel their mass creating fusion at a much more moderate pace they don't have as much pressure collapsing in on the core of the stars to impulse and encourage the the rapid rate of nuclear fusion that these supergiants do and so they live for much longer up to you know tens of billions of years even these are called generally red dwarfs smaller still are even brown dwarfs these are actually failed stars these are like very very large Jupiters maybe if Jupiter had ten times its mass it would be a brown dwarf they're not massive or hot enough to sustain the type of fusion that occurs in stars and they emit only they emit only a dim glow they may account for much of the ordinary matter in the universe here we have three pictures the supergiant Betelgeuse appears here as a disk because it's so big even though it's 500 light years away um, and this is it makes our sun it dwarfs absolutely dwarfs our sun so big um, double star system here a binary system is our is consisting of a bright yellow orange primary star and a dimmer bluish companion and here is a small insert of the globular clusters which are not quite galaxies but they are clusters in the oftentimes very very ancient even on galactic terms clusters that are made of very very old stars and tens of thousands of them clustered together oftentimes orbiting um, orbiting a little bit outside on the peripheral of the Milky Way Here, this one is star cluster M3, 
ancient objects that orbit galaxies, and this has uh, quite a bit, actually, about half a million stars. So, star remnants. Now, um, stars, of course, don't last forever. And then lastly, here up here is the brown dwarf. We're actually able to see the dot to the right of the center of this picture is a brown dwarf called Gliese 229b. B, the letter usually indicates it's a secondary or, if it's C, a tertiary component of a star system. And the bigger, brighter object is the red dwarf star Gliese 229, around which the brown dwarf orbits. So now for the remnants of stars. Of course we know they don't live forever. Even the smallest ones, longest lived, eventually do fade away. Stars of uh, medium mass, such as the sun, expand into large, low-density stars called red giants before they blow off most of their outer layers. And they then collapse to form white dwarf stars that gradually cool and fade. The expanding shells of blown-off matter surrounding the such stars are called planetary nebulae. Not because of anything to do with the planets around them, but actually because the original discoverer and namer of these objects was Herschel, William Herschel, a famous 17th century astronomer, and he thought Rather than being in their death throes, they were actually protoplanetary systems. And perhaps they were young stars with surrounded with spheres of opaque matter and gas that had yet to collapse into the disks that would eventually coalesce into planets. So he named them planetary nebula. Stars may be obscured by as yet unformed planets. Like many things that were named long ago, they uh, have since been found to be much different than the thing that were, they were originally named after, but the name stuck. And so, we still call them the remnants of average-sized stars that have blown off their diffuse atmospheres. We call planetary nebula. More massive stars have even more spectacular ends, disintegrating in explosions called supernovae. The expanding shell of ejected matter may be seen for thousands of years and is called a supernova remnant. Actually, there's one that we observed in maybe a thousand years ago. I believe it's the Crab, the Crab Nebula, that the Chinese and some other civilizations actually were able to record and it's pretty cool that they actually saw the supernova itself and it was so bright they could see it in the daytime sky and now a thousand years later we're able to see the remnants that our ancestors recorded which is a, a beautiful connection between history it's awesome can see here a remnant. The some of the more energetic, some of the larger stars that do collapse in the supernova. It's kind of where they collapse in on themselves and it creates a chain reaction where it's the core is constantly think of it as a a group of, you know, billions of nuclear bombs. It's a nuclear furnace, really. And it's constantly keeping the pressures of gravity at bay. But when you have a big enough star with enough material, the gravity created by such a large amount of mass in one central location 
is so immense that the actual pressure, even the pressure of billions of nuclear bombs pushing outward, can't stop the collapse. And so, once the things kind of buckle and fold under the pressure of gravity, that surges the core with even more energy than it had before, and that fuses even more atoms that otherwise would have been left unfused. And so in these last moments, the core of the star, stars big enough to create supernova at least, they have a cataclysmic chain reaction of explosions that very counter to the much more mild, mild um, diffusion of material in a you know pretty concentric ring of the planetary nebula. These create cataclysmic explosions that can be seen across millions and millions of light years, and they can even, from the largest stars, outshine the light, temporarily at least, of an entire galaxy of billions, hundreds of billions of stars. So for the largest of these stars, they create temporarily at least an immense illumination that outshines even the hundreds of billions of stars that make up galaxies that they might be in. So here is a supernova remnant. The Veiled Nebula is the shock wave from a star that exploded anywhere from five to fifteen thousand years ago. It's 2,600 light years away from us, and its material may one day, you can see this collapsed nebula here, it may one day spark the growth of new stars, because what happens, like we touched upon before, this is a really good example, and you can see the curvature here exactly matches what you would expect from a concentric radially emitting sphere of ejected material from such a powerful explosion in space as a supernova would be. This, this material isn't necessarily from the nova itself, but it's actually just nebulous molecules and elements, atoms floating in the void that are roughly compact, floating amongst themselves. And it's near enough to the supernova explosion that the energy, the shock waves emitted from the solar explosion has bombarded, I guess you might say, this cloud and compressed as it travels and emanates through it. Compressed all these atoms together. And once they're compressed together, they, through friction and all the motion amongst them, they start to emit light in infrared and then visible wavelengths. So here we can see the whole cloud itself is kind of thrown and pushed by the shock waves to perhaps create a whole new star system or multiple star systems. And just like the smaller stars before it, even supernovas do leave behind cores and remnants of materials. So part of the core collapses into a compact, extremely, extremely dense object known as a neutron star. These, as you might figure out by the name, um, their primary characteristic is that they are composed entirely of neutrons as opposed to protons, neutrons, and electrons that are the constituents of what we normally think of as atoms. Here, the pressure 
who leaves behind a core so dense and so compact that the protons and electrons, positive and negatively charged normally, have fused together to form a neutral neutron. Normally what's called neutron beta decay is where a neutron, and we'll get to that in a couple pages here, it's created of, um, I believe, an up and two down quarks. There's three subatomic particles within it. And the neutron can compose or, or decay into a proton and an electron, and then an anti-neutrino. Because, like Einstein's equations dictate, energy is equivalent to mass times the speed of light squared. So any matter's mass is going to be directly proportional to the energy created when that mass decays. And so, um, I guess a neutron is normally a little bit heavier than a proton. So that means it has some extra mass there. And when it decays into a relatively proportionally sized proton in a much smaller mass wise electron there's even some mass left over and this turns into what scientists call an anti-neutrino and so I think I believe uh, the coolest description um, the sheer density of what a neutron star actually is. It's these compact things, so we generally think of the atom as being a very, very, very tiny but massive atomic core. Have a nucleus with protons and neutrons. And the number of protons defines what the element is. And it's surrounded by a concentric field, I guess, of electrons, where in the neutron star, because there are no electrons or protons, it's just neutrons, they actually butt up and they're electrically neutral, so they won't actually electrically repel or attract one another, they're just so dense and so tight up next to one another that they take up much less space, so therefore they're much more compact than a typical soup of plasmic atoms would be. So what this actually means in human terms is that one spoonful of this stuff, if there's a spoon sturdy enough to hold it, would weigh as much as a mountain, a large one like Everest here on Earth. So this stuff is unfathomably dense and heavy. And then lastly, that's the last step before we hit the most interesting remnant of all star stellar explosions, a black hole. Anything beyond a star big enough to create a supernova and leave behind a neutron star as its core. Anything larger than that is going to create a black hole. This is, this is a star so large that trying to make sense of that amount of matter in that small of a space creates a, a singularity and physicists believe that Einstein's equations say that all that matter will uh, not be able to hold its structure, its actual physical structure, and it will collapse into a, sp a volumeless point in space. It will warp the fabric, the actual universe around it. And, of course, I don't think anybody really actually knows what 
plugging that much mass into an equation that yields an infinitely small point, or actually means, but, but we, as of 2019, have actually observed the accretion disk of burning up, melting, illuminating, radiating matter surrounding a black hole in the heart of the galaxy M87. And so, we do know that these black holes do exist, and we even have one in the center of our galaxy as well. So, these things are unimaginably heavy and dense, and they actually break what we classically understand as matter in space. They're hard to define. And that's what's left by the heaviest of stars. Moving on to smaller planets. Or smaller bodies in space. The solar system, our own star being the sun, and all the planets, asteroids, dwarf planets, comets, clouds of small objects in the Oort cloud and its perimeters, is thought to have formed from dust and gas that condensed into a spinning disk called a protoplanetary disk. Scientists aren't really sure exactly how our solar system started, of course, because it's five, at least five billion years in the past. But they think they have a pretty good understanding based on ob observing, um, you know, the multitude, millions of other stars that are similar in mass and appearance and composition in our galaxy. They think that, like we said, with supernovas bursting forth plumes of energy that send shock waves through otherwise pretty inert clouds, pretty stagnant, pretty motionless, relatively, clouds of um, interstellar molecules, then certain areas of those clouds, all it takes is a little bit, a slight, slightly denser patch of those clouds for a feedback loop to initiate, which creates a new center of gravity towards which all the other molecules, or many at least, in the cloud gravitate. And once that happens, of course, the three-dimensional spherical cloud that starts to coalesce and collapse picks up a rotation, an angular velocity, and just like the sun and the earth have a little slight bulge around its equator, the point most perpendicular to the axis of rotation, these clouds also, these protoplanetary nebulae, the initial stages of our own solar system's formation, it, it too began to collapse into more a more two-dimensional spherical um, disc-like shape. And when it did, the heavier elements like iron and such metals, as silver and gold and um, all the elements much heavier than hydrogen and helium, they were the first to, outside of the, um, the sun, to coalesce into bodies, small bodies that, just like the rings of Saturn, have little moons that clear the entire ring of that same distance away, the same radius away from Saturn. That's what creates the little distinct 
ring shapes. And these bodies, they eventually gather enough mass and to the point where they become the sole attractor for all the elements, all the particles of matter within that same um, orbital distance, orbital field. And let me actually, maybe drawing a little diagram would be, make it a little clearer. Hokusai's wave. What's that? What is that? Oh, that's Middle Earth. So, these masses are very... very three-dimensional. And then over time, they do collapse into a much more disc-like shape with the star as our star picks up speed and rotates and um, increases with an angular velocity, has an increasing angular velocity, so in that same way, there would be planets starting to form because once a couple rocks hit together they smash into each other and perhaps with enough velocity they melt together and they create magma and then before you know it, you have a little rock that's, you know, a mile wide. And then maybe a couple miles. And it's a runaway feedback loop. Just like Inception. We have, uh... All it takes is... That initial area that's just slightly more massive than the other areas. And they'll start basically clearing the field around their same uh, orbital distance from whether it's the sun, planets clearing the field around the sun, or moons clearing the field around planets. And so, let's see, the sun perhaps was made out of a group of stars. Uh, or, or perhaps a, it formed out of an entire stellar nursery, much like we see with the Orion Nebula. It has many, many stars forming, and they almost, they form in groups. Of course, after maybe a few hundred orbits, a few hundred, two million, two hundred million year long orbits around the uh, Milky Way galaxy, they, the groups might begin to disperse, but initially, out of a large nebulous cloud structure, we might have the beginnings of the, you know, the largest things to, um, the first things to collapse would be the largest stars that would form out of it. They would compose most of the matter out of the nebula. And their life cycles are, like we said, the shortest, but they do gain the initial um, mass, most of it, maybe 80% of it, and the rest of the stars um, are much less massive, they have much less material now in the nebulous cloud to draw off of, so they become more average sized, main sequence, sun-like stars. But, nonetheless, the, uh, the sun, we think, was formed in this, in this manner, you know, out of an interstellar nursery of molecules that was maybe initiated into collapsing into local areas of very dense matter. 
and of course once that happens just like a black hole a very mild version of a black hole all matter is attracted to it that's why we think supermassive black holes might be the in many ways the driver of galaxy structures and dynamics because once you have a black hole form, if it's near enough to other matter, it will inevitably draw it in into its orbit, if not completely beyond its event horizon. So, our star formed, the percentage of the mass of the initial nebulous material that out of which you know our star and our whole solar system is derived ends up being about 99.8 or 9 percent so so that's saying that 999 out of every thousand particles in the entire solar system protoplanetary mass of material was ultimately became and was drawn in to our sun and that's a, an incredible percentage of the material that's um, it just gives you a good perspective of just how massive and therefore gravitationally dominant our sun really is in the solar system now from there the remaining tenth of a percent 90% of that resides entirely in just Jupiter and Saturn alone. And as you might begin to suspect, the remaining 84% of that matter outside of the Sun and Jupiter and Saturn actually resides entirely, 84% of the remainder resides entirely in Uranus and Neptune. So you can imagine where the Earth lies on that. I think it's something of the order of three millionths of a percent of the sun's mass, which is roughly of the whole solar system. So that that's one way of looking at the Earth and put, put ourselves in perspective of just our own solar system, let alone the galaxy and the... Uh, you know, not even touching upon the universe and the size that it truly is. So, as this disk is starting to form, we have the sun at the center, of course, and all the material in the orbits closest to it, you know, maybe make mercury right there um just like in a you know a cup if you pour you know styrofoam and sand and water and oil and rocks those will all segregate themselves in within earth's or due to earth's gravitational influence from heaviest at the bottom to lightest which would really be the atmosphere or the gas, the gaseous air at the top. And it's in very similar fashion, because of course the same laws of physics apply here on Earth as they do in elsewhere in the universe, everywhere else as far as we know. All the inner planets here, they are composed, they all have iron cores, they have a lot of metallic constituents, and we have the asteroid belt, maybe, and then way out here, if we're trying to draw this to scale, I mean, this is not even anywhere near scale, but I think if that were truly the size of the Earth, Jupiter might be like something like, you know, a quarter of the size of this entire page. But out here, Jupiter, with its 
many moons, and slightly smaller Saturn with its rings and many moons, they are made of mostly lighter things, and in fact Jupiter's made of much the same light elements as the Sun is. And perhaps that's because hydrogen and helium, lithium, all those lighter elements are less massive and are maybe move in swarms quicker and they were able to condense and collapse much quicker than all the heavier elements and so the sun drew in most mostly hydrogen um, and helium those are the most abundant elements in the universe after all and the remainder the heavier elements out of the remainder rather the heavier elements sank towards the interior we call the inner solar system and then out here all of this and beyond would be the outer planets or outer solar system Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune they're all gas giants, as I uh, describe, you know, talk endlessly about in my gas giants video. They're mostly lighter elements. We don't know for sure what's at their core, but we know they're much, generally much lighter, uh, made of much lighter elements than the inner planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And we have outside of that, we have what's called the Kuiper Belt, which is on the innermost side of which is Pluto. And it's um, Moon, which is pretty much another planet, a dwarf planet orbiting it. So it's almost like a binary dwarf planet system. The Kuiper Belt is a series of icy worlds and comets and asteroids that are orbiting way beyond Neptune even, the last of the planets. And then way, way, way beyond that, the Kuiper Belt, at the furthest extent of the solar systems, the sun's gravitational dominion in the galaxy, is the Oort Cloud. Here we have, um, let's see if it says anything about the Oort Cloud here. No, not much. That's okay. So the central material became the sun, while the other outer material matter formed planets and other small cold objects further away from the sun of course the generally colder the objects get a planet is a technically as humans define it a sphere a heavenly celestial sphere and that's at least a thousand miles across orbiting a star and unlike brown dwarfs they don't produce nuclear fusion. So if Jupiter were maybe 10 times its size, so if maybe the Sun only was composed of 99% of the total solar system's matter and Jupiter got about 9 or 10 times more access to matter than it does, maybe it would actually be big enough to apply enough pressure at its very core to initiate nuclear fusion and then it would be the lower lowest lower most limit massive limit of a star but of course it's not so it remains just a very large planet since planets and protoplanetary disks are found orbiting stars elsewhere in our galaxy, it's probable that the solar system is actually pretty typical in that planets are very common 
in the universe, and in fact we've found many exoplanets as uh, the years go on and we search for gravitational perturbations due, you know, around other close nearby stars due to these large and even smaller um, nearing Earth-sized planets. Either we see the star itself wobble due to another planet, you know, one of its planets tugging on it gravitationally, or if we happen to be perfectly lined up to where the we're not looking at it from this view, but instead we happen to see perfectly dead on one of its own planets orbit right in front of it. We might see the light of the star dip a little bit, just to dim just a few, you know, millions of a percent. But that's all we need to actually, uh, for our very, the most advanced instruments we have t to detect a slight, um, lessening of the uh, luminosity of it. In the solar system, the planets are either gas giants, Saturn and Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune, or the inner planets, the rocky, worldly terrestrial planets. Planets that aren't defined by their atmospheres, but more so by the crust that surrounds their molten cores. Mar uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Still smaller objects uh, fall into about five categories. Moons are objects that don't orbit the sun exclusively, but they orbit planets orbiting the sun. And then we have asteroids, which could be trapped and become moons. Asteroids are rocky bodies of uh, about 150 feet all the way up to about 600 miles across. Comets further to differentiate from asteroids. They're chunks of ice and rock. Oftentimes asteroids are close enough to the sun where the ice would have long ago melted off their surface. So they might, in some cases, be ancient comets that have been trapped in the inner solar system. And, uh, of course, comets being ice, that mainly means that they're all the way out at the far reaches, um, in the Kuiper Belt, and some even in the Oort Cloud. Then we have ice dwarfs, which are similar but are up to a few hundred miles across. And that would be the ice dwarf planet Pluto, which we would define as not quite a planet anymore because it's so, so small and so distant. And we have meteoroids are the remains of shattered asteroids or simply dust from comets. Imagine in 1610, over 400 years ago, Galileo was one of the first people, I, he might be the first, to look up with these glass lenses that were able to magnify whatever object you were looking at. And he looked at Jupiter and saw that it looked like it had a series of string that are pretty much in a straight line of stars around it. Again, it really does look very much like that. You see Jupiter, but maybe you see a wispy band. And then maybe if you have a little better telescope, you might be able to see the faintest outline of the great red spot. But then you really just see outside of it these tiny little dots, and those are its moons. Galileo was able to see four moons, the largest of Jupiter's moons, 
Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, all Greek names. Here we have the comet Akia Zeng. A few comets travel in orbits that bring them close to the sun. Frozen chemicals in the comet then vaporize as they get close and uh, get bombarded by the heat and radiation off the sun. They always, if they do get vaporized and as they get towards the roughly about three Earth distances from the sun, comets begin to um, project a, a tail out of the coma, which would be the nucleus here. You can see you have a dust tail and a gas tail. And the tail, kind of counterintuitively, or very much actually, unlike the what you would think of as maybe a tail, a tailwind coming off something uh, on Earth, maybe out of a jet engine or something, they don't always follow, they don't always point directly away from the motion of the comet. In fact, if a comet's coming in like this way, the tail, even though the comet might be going that way, the tail is going to be, or maybe, let's see, This might be a better example. So instead of the comet's tail being following the exact opposite direction of the trajectory it's of its velocity, its tail is actually going to be directly opposite the solar wind. So it might be moving this way, but its tail is going to be all the particles blasted off by the solar wind, so the direction of the solar wind, of course, emanating directly out from the sun. Okay, what do we have next? So we're going to move up the universal cosmic ladder and talk about galaxies and much larger scale objects, much more massive, much more gravitationally dominant, and the largest players in the cosmic dance of celestial bodies. We'll start with the primary players that uh, constitute much of what we know, even though we'll not, uh, not the majority of it, as we'll get to with dark matter and dark energy. So up next is galaxies. The solar system occupies just a tiny part of our enormous disk-shaped structure of stars, gas, and dust we call the Milky Way. And what's truly astounding is that we, we really only about a hundred years ago were able to develop, again through the scientific method that really truly kicked off only about 400 years ago, the tools to enable us to really get a, an accurate perspective of ourselves along the scale of distances and volume of the universe and recognize that the galaxy we live in is really only just one of hundreds of billions, if not trillions, of other galaxies. Massive groups of billions of stars themselves drifting in along these large filaments we call galactic superclusters. And it's, it's really a an amazing, an amazing, amazing feat that we were able to discover this. And I think we're really blessed to be in this age. You know, we've had a lot of incredibly sad disasters of human conflict in the 20th century, the world wars, 
among the foremost of them, but we've also, alongside that, have an, had an incredible advancement in technology, and therefore our ability to probe and understand our place in the universe. So really, un until a hundred years ago, our galaxy was thought to comprise the whole universe. We thought every single star we saw in the sky, um, even with the largest telescopes, were, was all part of the same kind of local group, maybe a few tens of thousands of light years across. And um, it was just a matter of, you know, categorizing and cataloging them and, you know, discovering the uh, the local universe in in many ways um, you know that wasn't everybody but we're when we speak of we and what we thought at certain points in human history we generally just <laughs> we discuss what the average educated person might believe there were of course many people from ancient astronomers to uh, classical modern philosophers like Kant in the 1700s who came up with hypotheses that there were in fact different island universes which we now call properly galaxies um, drifting amongst themselves much like this picture here depicts but um, yeah we really thought that was just it we, we it was really just a failure of imagination at its heart. And we couldn't really imagine anything outside a, a limit of local stars and groups. Today we know that just the observable part of the universe contains more than a hundred billion separate galaxies. And I think this book might be up to about 15 years old, so I think that number's gotten into the trillions now. And we don't know where it will ultimately lead. We really don't. They vary in size from dwarf galaxies, a few hundred light years across, to um, an end containing a few million stars to giants spanning several hundred thousand light years containing several trillion stars. So we're closer to a giant than we are a dwarf globular, you know, cluster, dwarf galaxy. We are the center of mass around which many dwarf galaxies themselves orbit. And uh, in our local group, as we saw, it's, um, we're only second to the large Andromeda galaxy, but uh, so as well as stars, galaxies do contain clouds of gas and dust and dark matter, all held together by gravity. So we'll uh, tackle dark matter in just a little bit. And like all science. We uh, astronomers love categorizing the galaxies into easily identifiable shapes and structures. So we have um, a spiral, which we think ours is, I believe. We got barred spiral, which is uh, we have pictured here. Spiral arms radiate from the ends of the central bar-like structure, rather than from the nucleus. We have elliptical, which is more like spherical or football shaped, much like the sombrero galaxy. We have lenticular, which means lens shaped. Um, I don't know if they have a, an example here. And then, of course, much like, uh, you know, like the duck-billed platypus, we have to have a irregular category, a, a category into which we put, it's kind of a junk drawer category, put all the ones that don't 
fit there. Astronomers identify galaxies by their number in one of several databases of celestial objects. For example, NGC 1530 indicates galaxy 1530 in a database called the New General Catalog. And here we have galaxy M81, which was a, an older catalog invented by the, um, or initialized, I guess, by the astronomer Messier. So these M stands for Messier, and he just listed them. At, I don't know if there was any particular order, or if it was just he started numbering them as he found them. Uh, but we have M81 here. This image, taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope, shows a nearby spiral galaxy, M81. The sensor captured infrared radiation rather than visible light, and the image highlights dust in the spirals. Um, the galaxy's nucleus in spiral arms, which um, is really cool. You can see a lot more in the infrared spectrum than the visible light. So I'm going to shift over here now to galaxy clusters before we get to black holes. Galaxies are bound by gravity to form clusters of about 20 to up to several thousand galaxies. They vary from 3 to 30 million light years across. Some have a concentrate, concentrated central core and a well-defined spherical structure of galaxies forming the outer circumference of the sphere. Others are irregular in shape and structure, probably meaning that they're more chaotic in their motions. To me, it's really cool um, to perceive what we look at as these, you know, beautiful pictures of galaxies that look like they're really just some stationary wallpaper, like backdrop of the cosmos. They're so large and on such an unimaginably large scale and massive scale too that they they seem motionless to us and for all intents and purposes they really are but what's really cool to remember is that we are just taking a snapshot every time we literally take a picture all that is is a moment in time and the temporary location that they're at amongst a, you know, billion year long dance with the other objects that they're surrounded by. So here, this central image is really um, symbolic of the dynamic, constant, incessant movement of these galaxies and the fact that they, like we are just nothing but an accumulation with our brains being an emergent structure that comes out of trillions of atoms, galaxies are really nothing amongst themselves but a structure composed of billions and billions of stars. And so here we have what looks like the result. The Tadpole Galaxy lies 420 million light years away. Like any galaxy, it's a vast spinning wheel of matter bound together by gravity. The streamer of stars emerging from this galaxy is thought to have been torn out by the gravity of a smaller galaxy passing through it. It's really, really awesome to remember that, that, you know, our galaxy might have and most likely is the result of, uh, you know, a few dozen smaller dwarf galaxies merging and merging over billions of years until we finally have arrived at a largely stable, very large structure 
full of hundreds of billions of stars. And um, it's it just adds to the wonder that we're really in the middle of a uh, dynamic dance of these huge cosmic structures. And we're able to see, take a real close look at them at a certain particular point in their trajectory on the way to their their ultimate fate, if we can even talk about galaxies with uh, words like that. The neighboring Virgo cluster is a large irregular cluster of several hundred galaxies lying about 50 million light years away. Chains of about a dozen or so galaxy clusters are linked up loosely by gravity and they make up what we call superclusters, which can be up to about 200 million years in extent. Superclusters are in turn arranged in broad sheets and uh, filaments, like you might see in a spider's web, separated by voids of about a hundred million light years. The sheets and voids form a network that permeates the entire observable universe. So here we um, we could see the. Make sure you see that right. I gotta see the Hickson. Okay. Here we have the Hickson compact group. This cluster includes a face-on spiral galaxy in the center of the image. Very very cool. You can see that right there. and then two closer oblique spirals and an elliptical galaxy at the lower right. And this is um, a really nice diverse image right here where we have called this cluster down here uh, Abel 1689. And this is one of the most massive galaxy clusters that we know. It's thought to contain hundreds of galaxies. So now going to black holes. A black hole is a region of space containing at its center some matter squeezed into a point of infinite density. We call this a singularity. This would be Einstein's equations amounting to dividing by infinity within a spherical region around the singularity, the gravitational pull is so great that nothing, not even light, is able to escape. And that is saying a lot. Light is essentially massless, and it doesn't have anything that goes in the universe faster than it. And so, Really, black holes are one of the most unimaginable, hard to visualize, hard to even conceptualize objects in the entire universe. So, because they themselves don't emit light, but they certainly have a huge, they have a huge impact on matter all around them, in space itself, as we're going to find out later. Um, they can be detected, not directly, but very much indirectly, from the behavior of material around them. Those discovered so far typically have a disk of gas and dust spinning around the hole throwing off hot, high-speed jets of material or emitting radiation such as x-rays as the material falls beyond the event horizon, the, the point at which no light is going to escape. So it just slowly fades into a, a black sphere, really. Even though the point 
the singularity itself is supposedly um, without volume. There is no, it takes up no actual space. It's just a single point. The effect that it has on everything around it is going to be, you know, I don't know, maybe millions or billions of miles across. So anything within a couple astronomical units of the black hole is going to be so close to it that it's light and every characteristic of it will not ever be able to be seen again from outside the event horizon. So there are two main types of black holes that we know about, um, supermassive and smaller ones on the scale of stars. We call stellar. Supermassive black holes, which can have a mass equivalent to billion of suns, exist in the centers of most galaxies, including our own. Their exact origin is not yet understood, but they may be a byproduct of some process of galaxy formation. Stellar black holes form from the collapsed remains of supergiant explosions, and they actually may be more common than we previously thought in the galaxy. Here at the bottom, the black hole SS433 is situated in the center of this false colored x-ray image. It's detectable because it's sucking in matter from a nearby star and blasting out material and x-ray radiation. Visible here as two bright yellow lobes. And of course, this book is um, its about 15 years old, so it's not going to have the new image from the galaxy Messier, or M87, of the black hole that we just found through the Event Horizon network of telescopes. But this one here from NGC 4438 is a really good depiction of the effect that black holes can have on the material surrounding them. Um, trying to see if there's going to be any more elaboration on that. I don't think so. So the uh, you could think of the black hole. It's it's going to be and yeah, we'll do this right here. So, so this might be oh I don't know. One hundred billion miles across. And anything that's falling inside, if you have a little piece of matter here say it's really, really hot, maybe a, a star, a remnant of a star falls in, and its light is simply pulled by gravity all the way back in. If it were a little further out, its light might get a little bit closer, but ultimately fall back in. If we're right here, right on the inside of the, if it were right on the inside of the event horizon, the horizon across which all, all events are no longer visible, then maybe it's light momentarily pops out before it's completely again sucked back in but if it does or if it hasn't yet crossed that horizon then it's it's light might be bent but it will eventually escape and um so we can 
get a little, maybe, maybe that helps. Hopefully it doesn't make it worse, but your understanding of what it looks like when you see, let's see, how's that look? When you see the um, interstellar-like black holes that are apparently very accurate. And they, um, right at the core there, this is entirely black. It's dark, it's without light, it's just void of any information. And it's so cool to think of that. But what you're seeing, it's really hard, it was hard for me to visualize exactly what was going on when we had this light from behind here coming around and undergoing what's called gravitational lensing gravitational lensing right there because the black hole is bending the actual light that normally, um, you know, even our sun, as massive as it is, it doesn't really bend light that much. It bends it, I think someone said, or I once read that it bends light, and this is actually one of the first experiments that was able to conclusively prove Einstein's theory of relativity was accurate, much more accurate than Newton's previously dominant theory of gravity. It bends light, our sun does, about the width of a human hair looked at from a distance of about 100 yards or 100 meters. And, I mean, a, the width of a human hair is almost the limit of perception you know, held out at arm's length, let alone looking at it from, you know, that far of a football field away. So, you know, our light was found to bend, our sun was found to bend light, but you can imagine a, a an object like a black hole that could be billions and billions of times more massive than our sun just how much it's going to be bending light. So, if you have light here, you know, trying to um, escape, if it's outside the event horizon, and it hasn't yet fallen within that boundary of no return, which, you know, it's going to be uh, all dark in here. it will definitely undergo some bending. And the closer it gets, the more bending it'll do. So if it shoots out this way, it might not bend that far. You know, if it shoots this way, like directly away from the event horizon, maybe it only undergoes a slight bend. So what this light is here, you know, all these photons, if we, like the um, event horizon, and I want to do a separate video on the event horizon itself. Maybe I'll, I'll have it done by the time I, uh, I post this one. Um, it's just really amazing. It really, it's just so baffling. It's so wonderful to be able to think about what that actually means when you're looking at the event horizon telescope pictures of the black hole being imaged. The light, even though it's a fuzzy patch, 
that is actual collected photons from the center of this galaxy that's millions of miles away and the light is actually the light that's already um, you know that makes it our direction is light that has already been bent by the gravity of the black hole it's been bent around and if we're over here you know our little solar system millions and millions of light years away but it eventually makes it to us that's light that's probably you know came from the other side of the black hole uh, so that is very awesome to think about I think so we're gonna end this first section about the um, you know I guess about the observable aspects of the universe before we get into matter relativity or our theories of forces and physical laws of the universe with dark matter and dark energy it's kind of a as far as I know even in the last you know since this book has been written and revised in the last 10 to 15 years dark matter and dark energy are still elusive underlying fundamental concepts that scientists have simply um, f observed and collected data on the effects of but don't quite know the causes don't quite know you know the fundamental nature of so there's far more matter in the universe than is contained in the stars and other visible objects all other visible objects the invisible mass we just call dark matter um, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say it best that they don't know what it is so they just gave it the name dark matter but that doesn't actually correlate with anything other than the fact that it's unobserved so they figure it doesn't put out light so it's not white it's dark its composition is unknown some might take the form of machos astronomers love ridiculous acronyms by the way massive compact halo objects dark planet-like bodies so they think maybe you know our galaxy is being affected gravitationally by very dark um, either planets or dwarf planets or dwarf stars even failed stars that are massive enough and in a large enough quantity to have a gravitational impact on the dynamics of our galaxy without being observable so they're not observable with um, regular telescopes and even um, even in the infrared which if they were producing radiative heat from from nuclear fusion and they were just too dim to be noticed in the visible wavelength you would think that we would be able to observe them with um, infrared and ultraviolet wavelength detectors but we can't so not even with that are they observable or WIMPs um, weakly interacting massive particles and these are exotic subatomic entities that scarcely interact with ordinary matter in the word massive there's just to denote that they have a mass even though it's uh, on the subatomic scale it's not to say that they're large objects they're just objects with a mass a detectable mass maybe on the size of a proton or something that just simply doesn't much like a neutrino interact with other matter in the universe in a detectable way evidence for dark matter includes the motion of galaxies in clusters they move faster than can be explained by the gravity of visible matter 
there, uh, so there must be further mass present. And also there's, it seems even within our own galaxy, the outermost stars are propelled on by a gravitational force larger than the core of the galaxy would be able to impart on them. Even if all the dark matter deduced from observations is included, though, in the grand scheme of the universe, the density of the universe itself is not sufficient to satisfy theories of its evolution. And that's where dark um, energy comes into play here. To find a solution, cosmologists have proposed the existence of dark energy. They're, they're saying that this is a force that counteracts gravity and causes the universe to expand faster than it otherwise would. And, uh, let's see. We'll be getting to... We'll be getting to this theory in the future. So the exact, you know, even though scientists don't know what dark matter is, at least they have two prime candidates, machos and wimps. But uh, yeah, with dark energy, it's entirely still speculative. They don't even know if there could be such a thing, and I guess it would be as fundamental as gravity, maybe, because gravity, uh, like we'll, like we will discuss in the next part, discussing matter and the fundamental forces of matter, is really elusive. Scientists still haven't uncovered a gravitron or graviton, a particle that carries the force of gravity, like they have with the strong and weak and electromagnetic forces. In search of dark matter, down this little excerpt down here, it says to find dark matter, scientists are investigating several forms it could take. Uh, underground detectors search for evasive particles such as wimps and neutrinos. And neutrinos are so tiny, they were once thought to be massless, but they do actually have a minute mass. There are so many neutrinos in the cosmos that they, uh, their combined mass would be about 1-2% to 2 of the universe's dark matter. Wimps, if detected, could account for far more. And we'll, uh, again, we'll, we'll talk more in the future about the, the methods, and they're really interesting how they actually, the lengths scientists go to try to detect these near massless particles. They're so inner, um, unreactive with other particles that it's like, I think they could travel through you know, tens, twenty feet of solid steel with essentially no deflection at all. So it's pretty amazing how that works. We will be getting into much more, including neutrinos, dark energy, um, subatomic particles, in the nature of the space-time theories of matter and energy in the future, guys. So for now, I'll leave us with, uh, with this, with this topic. So we'll call it quits for now. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.